Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Welcome everybody on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I work with our education department at the museum. This morning, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Ava Brettler, a Holocaust survivor from Romania, Hungary. And afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to ask her questions. Before we begin, I would like to share a few words about the museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in the 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors. In the early 1960s, this small group of about 15 to 20 Holocaust survivors who had just recently come to the United States decided that they needed to create a memorial for their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust. At this time, the Holocaust had only ended about 15 years earlier, and most people were not yet ready to face this tragic history. Thanks to the courage and foresight of this small group of survivors, we have a museum that you can see behind me in my virtual background, always with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. We can't do the work that we do today without our witnesses and volunteers like Ava, who share their stories on a regular basis with students and other visitors and general audiences. And every Thursday, we have speakers share their stories at 11 o'clock. And this has been a regular program for the last year that we've been doing. And we're so honored to have you, Ava, share your story with us. After Eva shares her story, um, you can use the Q&A box um, to type in questions. And uh, we just thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your story and for everything that you do for our museum. Thank you, Michael. And I appreciate the background on the museum. Let me roll back the clock and give you a little information. So I start with my parents. Both my father and mother, including myself, we were born in a region which is called Transylvania. And that particular region was uh, annexed to Hungary in uh, 1940, May. I was born in Cluj or Kolozsvar in 1936, November 29th. I was the only child. My father came from a big family. He was one of 10 siblings. And my father became a printer. His name was Shen. Shandor Alexander with the last name Katz. My mother came from a family of, she was one of six children. And uh, she ended up becoming a hat maker. And from early age on, she loved making cute little outfits for me with matching little hats. I was about four and a half years old. My father came home, we lived in Kolozsvar at the time. And my father came home and said, I lost my job. I said, Papa, how is that possible? Last week they honored you as an outstanding worker. I said, he said to me, yes, I know, but I lost my job because we are Jewish. I knew we were Jewish, but it was very, very confusing at that young age. And my father had the foresight. He said, let's move to a region where people don't know us. We had a beautiful little apartment paintings, needlepoints hanging on the wall. 
we left everything behind and we got on a train that took us to Budapest. The war was raging throughout Europe already and there was a tremendous shortage of apartments. So my parents really had difficulty finding a place. Eventually they found a room. In one room was our, next to us our landlady, Mrs. Gross. In the other room was a single woman who became an SS woman. So you can see the diversity in one little apartment. Both my father and mother found jobs and I was sent to a little nursery school. On March 19, 1944, Hungary was invaded by the German. And in record time, they established the ghetto by April 1st. My father was serving in a labor camp and my mother didn't want her to go into a ghetto. Somehow she got papers to a safe house. It was a Swiss safe house. And we stayed there for a while until the local government no longer accepted the safe house. And then my mother got papers to get into a Swedish safe house. The same thing happened. A short time later, they were closing down the place. And as they were closing it down, I was very small for my age. My mother put me in a basket and she put the basket on the top of her furniture in Europe, we didn't, have box, we didn't have closets. We used to keep our clothes in furniture. She put blankets over me. And she asked me, Eva, be very, very quiet. I promise I will come and get you. By the time she came to get me, I was soaking wet. I was so embarrassed. I'm a little over seven years old. My mother helped me to change my clothes and was hugging me. It's okay. We collected our little belongings and we were ready to exit the safe house where a policeman who was standing guard there looked at my mother and said, move very, very quickly. I don't see you. So he basically saved us. We started to walk. It was already dark outside and there was a curfew. After a certain time, you couldn't be on the street. And as we were walking, my mother told me, I have such a big surprise for you. You will have a new name. As I mentioned, my maiden name is Katz. It's a very popular but extremely Jewish name. And my new name became Eva Naj. And Naj in Hungarian means big. And my mother said, no, you really have to act like a big girl. Even your name says big. So we were walking and my mother was practicing my new name. And we had to decide where to go. And my mother remembered that the SS woman's brother used to bring me little toys and was nice. And we decided, we visited him before. And we decided to go to his place. As we knocked on his door, he let us in. The next morning, it was extremely warm. We got dressed and my mother said, I will try to enroll you to school. I never attended school before the bar. 
and we got really nicely dressed. My mother was wearing heels and she took me to a local school and they accepted me. I was so excited under my new name. And then she even found a place where we could stay. But we decided to go back for the few belongings we left with this man. And as we are ready to knock on his door, from the side, two policemen steps out. They knew our real name. We were arrested. First taken to a police station. From a police station, we were transported outside of Budapest to a brick factory. That brick factory was used as a, a holding place for people. Most people had with them additional clothes, food. All we had was the light summer clothes that we were wearing. And we started on the forced labor march toward Germany. The march was very, very difficult. Every so often they took the young children and they put them on those horse drum wagons. And when we arrived to our temporary destination, they set up a place where we could be reunited with the family. One day my mother's feet were hurting so bad. It was all bloody. And as she took me to the wagon, she begged, could I please come on the wagon with my daughter? They put me on. They pushed my mother away. A short time later, we did hear shots. When we arrived to our temporary destination, I went to the place where we were supposed to reunite. Each time the door opened, I was waiting for my mama to come. I'm still not eight years old. By the way, this happened sometimes in September 1944. And she never came. I started to cry. One of the women who was coordinating things there, she said, come here, young girl. I have a feeling your mother escaped. I'm going to watch you. The bombing was so heavy that day that the whole sky was lighted up. I was shaking. I was so scared. And this lovely lady held on to me. Eventually, we were pushed into a cattle car. The cattle car was filled to the maximum. You didn't even have a chance to sit down. And when the cattle car opened, we were told we arrived to a camp called Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück was a woman's camp and over four-fifth of the population perished there. As they ordered, as we were coming up from the cattle car, a few names were called out. And one of the names was that lovely lady who held on to me. She tried to pull my hand with hers, but they didn't let her. They ordered us to give up all our personal belongings. The only thing I had was a little ring, which I got for my seventh birthday. I slipped off the ring and I put it under my tongue. 
I was so desperate to have something that connected me with my family. We were ordered in in a building where they told us to undress. I grew up in a religious family. To be naked was something shameful. I put my arms front of me. By the way, I forgot to mention, we arrived to Ravensbrück on January 1945. And that part of the country is so, so cold. Anyway, when I tried to cover up myself and they made us undress, an SS woman hit my arm with a whip. I dropped my arms very quickly. They shaved my hair. They sprayed us with disinfectant. I have very light skin and I'm allergic. And the thing was just biting my skin all over. They gave me strange looking clothes. It looked like striped pajamas. They were much too big on me, including the wooden shoes. And they ordered us out from the building. I stood in the corner. An older lady walked by and she said, young girl, how come you don't go to your barrack? I said, I'm sorry, I don't belong to anyone. She said, oh yes, from now on you belong to me. And you call me Tanti. Tanti means like an ant. She says, you look just like one of my grand, my nieces. She and I ended up in the barrack. They had three bunk beds on top of each other. There were no mattresses, no covers, and definitely no pillows. And as I mentioned, it was extremely cold. We cuddled up next to each other. Our daily routine was wake up time and we had to stand in attention. And then they made us walk around in the campground. One day as we went to sleep, I woke up and I heard the baby cry. It was so unusual, there were no babies in the barrack. The other woman said, you have to keep it a secret. A baby was born during the night and we are going to save both the mother and the child. The child. I looked at my tante and I asked her, I'm a little over eight years old now. Do you think I will ever become a mother? Do you think I can have children? She held on to me and she said, you have to promise me. You don't give up hope. And I give you a few new prayers to learn. One night, as we went to sleep in the early morning, wake up car came yelling us to get out from bed. My tante wasn't moving. I kind of cuddled up next to her. The other woman noticed in the barrack and they pulled me down. And they said to me, Eva, don't give up so easy. And other kind strangers stepped in to watch me. The Soviet army was approaching the camp 
and the camp was being liquidated. We were pushed back in a cattle car. And this time I ended up in Bergen-Belsen. The conditions were very, very bad in Ravensburg. But in Bergen-Belsen, the first thing we seen when we got up the cattle car were mountains of corpses. This time we ended up in a barrack. We were all sleeping on the concrete floor. And the barrack where we stayed was so, so infested with all kinds of bugs and lies that when I could find a place to roll my head against, it was such a relief because I was continuously bitten. One day, there was a lot of whispering going on and I overheard that a truckload of children were saved and these were the so-called diamond children and they were going to collect ransom for them, but the people who had them abandoned the truck. And a lovely lady by the name of Luba saved all 54 children who were in that truck. And miraculously, 50 of, 52 of them survived. I kind of wanted to be together with some other children, but I couldn't go from one barrack to the next. But just hearing from her, it sounded so, so wonderful. One day as we were walking around the campground, one of the women noticed that under the wire fence there was an opening. And next to the kitchen area, there was a lot of potato peels. And she turned to me and she said, Eva, we will push you under. Bring us out some potato peels. Well, I got a little scratched up, but I did bring out the potato peels. They grabbed it from me so quickly, I never had a chance to put a bite in my mouth. The same thing the second time. The third time they pushed me under, I said that I ate some potato peels before I brought them out. The conditions were horrible. People were dropping dead. And one day, my feet were hurting so, so bad. I was ready to go to the, to the, to the clinic to be seen with what's going on because my feet was hurting so bad. And as I'm ready to leave, the barrack, a woman turns to me and asks, where do you think you're going? I said, look at my feet, it's soft, it hurts. And she said, just sit down. She cut off some of her garment and ripped it, wrapped it around my feet. She said, you go in there, you will never come back. Just don't give up, please. One day, as I mentioned, it was the barrack was so badly infested that I kind of sneaked out. It looked beautiful, sunny outside. And there was some strange noise next to me. I stood frozen. I was scared. And a person approached me, I couldn't see him. And he actually picked me up. Not too close, I was so, so filthy. 
And as he put me down, he reached in his pocket and gave me a chocolate bar. By the way, I ate the chocolate bar all by myself. And that wonderful person was a British soldier. It was April 15, 1945, and we were liberated by the British. Well, I ate the chocolate by myself, and I became so sick. I developed high fever, and I kind of felt a little guilty it happened because I didn't share it with anyone. And I was shaking. They were taking me to the hospital, which was established by the British. And just as I'm ready to go in, our landlady, Mrs. Gross, sees me. And she tells me, Eva, I'm going to wait for you to get well and take you back to Budapest. I said, thank you, Mrs. Gross, but I really don't plan on ever going back to Budapest. I'm pretty sure my mother must have been killed and probably so was my father. I have a chance to go to Sweden and there, I'm going to live in the king's castle. Well, I came down with typhoid fever. I was so, so sick. And many of you know that Anne Frank and her sister died in March of 1945. Actually, just the time when I arrived to Bergen-Belsen. A real miracle, I got well, and I was shipped on a big, big Navy ship to Sweden. It was so exciting. When we arrived to Sweden, they never took us to the King's Castle. I was taken to a orphanage, and in that orphanage was that lovely lady, Luba. And she kind of became like all of our mothers. Most of the children were Polish, so we had to learn how to speak Polish, Swedish, and German. And I forgot how to speak Hungarian. I kind of became a little mischievous. And one day, I'm being summoned into the principal's office. I try to remember what did I do so bad this time. And the principal tells me, through the International Red Cross, my father located me. My father survived. And Mrs. Gross told my father I went to Sweden. So they were looking for me there. So on January 1947, this time I flew on a big plane, first to Czechoslovakia, to the Czech Republic, and then to Budapest with a train. And my father met me. My father spoke several languages, so for him to communicate with me was simple, because as I mentioned, Hungarian I could understand, but I could not utter the words. And my father informed me, I just turned 10 years old, that I have a new mother and a little brother. I presume chronologically a 10 year old is a very young, still a young child. But world experience wise, I was quite a bit older. I wasn't easy to handle. They enrolled me to a religious school. And the first day when I was going to class, 
the teacher had to make a stop and pointed for me to enter my classroom. Then I misunderstood the teacher and I entered the classroom, which were all boys. They were saying their morning prayers and when they see the silly girl walk into the class, they all started to laugh. When they were finished the prayer, the teacher turned to me and asked, young girl, what are you doing here? I said, can't you see I came to learn? But I answered in German. So the whole school found out that a young girl came back who doesn't speak Hungarian. A few days later, a lot of people came over with pictures, wanting to know if I recognize any of their relatives that didn't return. They cried, I ended up crying with them. I picked up Hungarian in record time and I forgot naturally all the other languages. When I finished sixth grade, the communist government decided that the religious school is no longer accepted and the school was closed down. And I had to attend public school where I encountered tremendous amount of anti-Semitism. And my grades went down from a straight A student And when I finished eighth grade, which was mandatory, they called the family gathering. I wasn't part of it, but they decided that since I'm not such a good student, I should learn a trade. So at age 14 and a half, I started to work on assembly line. Most of my friends continued in gymnasium, which was like high school. So I was kind of aware of it that working on assembly line is not really what I would like to do. And I looked around at that age, I could be more proactive. And I found a place where I could study chemistry, it was a technical school. But in order to qualify, I had to attend a summer session to see I would be capable of learning. And I did exceptionally well and the school accepted me. But the factory gave, said, you are not entitled. But the school fought for me and I ended up working full time and going to night school. On October 1956, the Hungarian revolution broke out. And that revolution was basically started by students who were demanding equal rights from the communism. I remember I was among the students walking in front of the parliament and the chaos that followed afterwards was extremely, extremely scary. A short time after the revolution began, I told my parents, I'm leaving Hungary. I took with me a Red Cross certificate, I passed the how to give first aid and a few items. And I ended up crossing the border between Hungary to Austria. I connected with some people and we ended up going to Vienna. And during that time, President Eisenhower had a special program for people who studied science. And by January 
1957, I arrived to the USA on a huge, huge Navy ship. And believe it or not, on the ship already, I got my green card. So I didn't realize how difficult it was to get, but I got my green card already on the ship. My new mother had a brother who lived in Van Nuys. And they were so, so wonderful. Those days when you arrived on the plane, people could come and greet you as you were coming off. And I felt like a little princess. So many people were welcoming me to the United States. My parents arrived a short time later with my little brother. On a blind date, I met another Holocaust survivor by the name of Martin. Four weeks later, he proposed. And four weeks later, we got married. And the dream of having a family became a reality. We had four children together, two sons and then two daughters. While the kids were young, with the encouragement of my late husband, I went back first to the community college, then I transferred to UCLA. I ended up getting a degree in psychology. I did change majors. And through a friend who I met, her name was Beba Leventhal. When I graduated from UCLA, she asked me, so what are you going to do with your degree? I asked her, what should I do? She says, I think you should come. I introduce you to my boss at Jewish Family Service. And I ended up going there and they trained me to become a volunteer. Through Beba, I was also fortunate to meet Sarah Moscovich. She was sitting next to me one night at dinner and she heard my accent. And she said, Eva, I'd love to interview you. That was back in 1982. I said, thank you, but I, I don't want to talk about my past. I was told when I came back, please don't talk. And my late husband said the same thing. And this lovely lady, she said, by the way, I'm starting a support group. And the support group will have people just like you who were children during the Holocaust. And that support group, which was co-run with uh, Flo Kinsler, became like an extended family to most of us. We were like each other's siblings getting to know. It really was so, so meaningful. By the way, after a short time later, working as a volunteer, I was offered the same day two different jobs, so they liked my volunteer work. And I ended up working at Jewish Family Service in the Immigrant and Resettlement Unit. And that was so meaningful to help people come to this country. As I mentioned, I really never talked about my experience until I was interviewed by Sarah Moscovich and Flo Kinsler. It really made a big difference. Also, they really wanted me to get involved. I ended up joining the Holocaust Advisory Board when it was established. And to begin with, I felt a little timid. How can I 
I really don't speak that much. How will I handle it? And I had tremendous support by people telling me, you will manage. There are several reasons, but I like to share my story. I speak a lot in schools. And when I look at the students' faces, and now I can't see any of your faces, but I turn to them and I ask them, please, please be my future ambassadors and carry on the memory of our loved ones. I have been extremely fortunate. I met Elie Wiesel several times. And Elie Wiesel states that you listening to a Holocaust survivor story, you become a witness also what happened during the Holocaust. I put tremendous emphasis on education. Education is one thing that nobody, nobody can take away from you. I, many times I speak to young students and I ask them, please, please be focused and carry on what is important for you in your life. And I make a point asking, giving them a homework. When you go home, please let your loved ones know how much they mean to you. Because believe it or not, I am now a grateful grandmother of nine grandchildren and my four children. But the little girl in me is still missing her mother. I hope I gave you an insight to my life story and I'm ready for your questions. Before I move on, I just wanted to share a picture this picture is my mother, my father, and I. And I am just a long, young child. And I'm lucky enough to have this picture of my father's parents. And my grandmother, with some of her children and grandchildren, ended up in Auschwitz. And unfortunately, in the gas chamber. And between my late husband and I, we had over 124 first degree relatives who perished. I wanted to share one more thing with you. Between the child survivors ended up putting together a book and that book has both of ours. It has my late husband's story and my story in it. And there are 52 stories and many, many schools use it for teaching. And the book is available through the museum. I think I shared the pictures too. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, we do have some questions. So we, one of the first questions is actually, did you keep your ring? Oh, I forgot to mention. My ring I had in Sweden and I was eating and growing and the ring became too big on my ring finger and I put it on my little pinky. And one day as I was washing my hand, the ring slipped off and it went down the drain. And I was so, so devastated. And Luba heard me cry and she told me, 
Eva, it's not a personal possession which will carry on your memory. You will keep it in your heart and soul. But believe it or not, I do miss my ring. But I know I did lose the ring. Thank you for sharing. You mentioned um, when you heard a baby being born in the camp, do you know if the baby survived? Uh, when I was interviewed by Sarah Moscovich, she did research and found out that that baby survived. I don't know too much more information about it, but Sarah Moscovich was the one who told me, Dr. Sarah Moscovich, that the baby and the mother both survived. How did your father and your stepmother survive the war? My father was in a labor camp. And my uh, new mother was hiding and her first husband was also killed, just like my father's first wife. But the only thing which was really rough on me, my father never, never spoke about my mother. And as a little girl, that was such a void not knowing. And later on, when I connected with my father's siblings, I used to question them all the time about my mother. And is there anything you found out about your mother later in life from your father's siblings? Uh, I did find out quite a few things, you know, when I was a little baby, one of my aunts came over and watched over me. And my mother came home from work to change the diaper. So my aunt, who was like a 13-year-old girl, didn't have to do that. Um, I have absolutely no idea when or where my mother was killed. Uh, it had to be, I have documentation which shows when we were taken, the Germans kept fairly decent record. And it showed when we were taken in uh, September was when we were arrested. And I, as I mentioned the dates, I have the printout which shows when I arrived to Ravensbrück and Bergen-Belsen. And also it shows when I, I arrived to the USA. But I have absolutely no idea. I arrived to Ravensbrück on January. 1945. So my mother must have been killed. Probably I remember being with her for a while. So it was probably either October or November, between October and November. Until I, you know, because by the time they shipped us to Ravensbrück, my mother wasn't around. Thank you. Have you been back to Cluj? Uh, I did go back a couple of times. The last time we had the international conference in Prague, it was in 1999. And uh, my older son became a rabbi and it, I kind of took him with me. And we went to all the places where the family was. And uh, we did visit Cluj also. I went back a couple of times. And I actually 
was in Cluj just before the revolution started because my mother had two siblings, sisters that survived and they lived there. And my father had two sisters and a brother who lived in, uh, in Romania at the time, Satumare or Satmar in Hungarian. So I remember visiting them in 1956. And then I went back several times later on with my children. Using your, um, your father and stepmother as an example, do you think that um, they, did they talk about their experiences together? And we actually haven't even discussed your husband yet, but did you and your husband talk about it? And is there any insight you can share about um, survivors who married and whether or not they discussed it? Uh, most of the friends my parents had good relatives and they were all survivors. Uh, I was told the young age on not to talk about it. My father and new mother didn't want the kids to know that she's not really my mother. And by accident, one day my oldest son was together with my father and my father says, help me to uh, pick an anniversary gift. And my son said, of course. By the way, how many years have you married, Grandpa? And when my father told my son, he said, how is that possible? Mom is older than that. And I remember my oldest son at the time was 14 and the other kids, you know, quite a bit younger. And all of a sudden in the kitchen, there is a lot of whispering and talking going on. And uh, they confront me. What's happening? How come you didn't tell us? And I said, I kind of respected, you know, that vicious and that's the reason. And I was lucky enough. I had that picture of my mother already because my aunt visited. And that was the first time the kids found out about it. Many of us really didn't want to talk about the experience what we went through and especially my late husband. He got real, he got very sick. And before he got so sick, he found out that his father was killed the day the city was liberated and uh, by a Hungarian policeman. And while he courted me, he spoke to me beautiful Hungarian. And after we got married, he said, please, please, let's not use that killer language in our home. So the kids never learned Hungarian because of that. And he stopped speaking Hungarian. Martin really didn't talk about his experience. He had extremely difficult, Martin, my late husband. His younger brother was collected and taken to Auschwitz where he was cremated. So many, many family members perished. And losing the father, the way he lost it, it was something I don't think he could ever forget. But I didn't know about it till after he died. Thank you. Um, how did you feel when you ate the chocolate bar? I still love the chocolate bar. <laughs> uh, you have to realize it's a little girl who has been 
hungry for so, so long. And all of a sudden, having something that delicious in my mouth, I mean, it was overwhelming. And uh, unfortunately, many, many people in bergen Belsen died after being liberated because they really didn't know how to handle the people who were famished for so long. And my love in, I ended up in a hospital where I was under observation more. But uh, I have, my late husband has first cousins who perished after they were liberated because and one of the few camps they actually burned on because it was so infested and so many people unfortunately became so so sick from typhus and all kinds of other bacterial infection that was going on around there. Tuberculosis was a big high percentage of people who they also had. Thank you for sharing. Um, you mentioned that in your early life, you were always encouraged to not talk about it. Did this result in nightmares or any other trauma uh, form of trauma that um and how did you cope with this until you met sarah moskovitz i think from early on i was really fortunate that i connected with people i could lean on uh, to some extent you know there is a survivor guilt too and uh, some older relatives uh, turned to me and said, how come you survived this thinking little girl? And my big tzaddik son perished. So, you know, you were thrown at things which were too, too hard to even believe and understand. And I have a feeling that my early imprint which I got from my mother tremendously. She kind of always said, be strong. And I realized, you know, I reached out very often. Uh, once uh, one of my close friend's mother really liked me and I asked her, can I move in with you? I wasn't so welcomed at home. And uh, I packed up ready to move. I haven't talked about it for years. And my new mother said to me, how can you bring such a shame to your father? It wasn't about me. So I realized if I had to look out for me, I have to do it. I won't get it from her. And as I mentioned, my father was so supportive of his new wife that I really couldn't lean on him. So it was pretty, pretty common. I remember one of my classmates, we were walking home one day and she told me that she just found out that she had a little brother who perished. And that was, you know, I told her, you know, my mother also, and we kind of connected. I mean, I must have been like 12 years old at the time. And each time we seen each other, we held hands. And so, by the way, you have to realize that I couldn't have survived before or after the war. 
without the compassion of people who really reached out to that little girl. Because it wasn't simple. And uh, I had, uh, when I was working, uh, when I started to go to school, they moved me from the assembly line to a lab. I became a lab assistant. And for me to wear the lab coat and everything, I felt so proud. And my new boss really took to me and he sent me to do research work in a university while I was still going to night school. So there were a lot of, lot of people who had the compassion and looked out for that little girl. And not so little girl, at the time I was about 16, 17, and he was just so nice to me, my uh, director at the time. And even today, I still keep in touch with the people I used to work with at Jewish Family Service. And I really, the only time I opened up, it was in 2007 when I started to share my stories. Because still then, when I started to speak in uh, both museums and schools, until then, I really kept very quiet. Thank you. The women who you mentioned helped you in the camps. Um, there were quite a few throughout your story. I know one of them you called Tante. Did you ever learn anything about them, like their names or where they were from? You have to realize the age of that young child. I must have been in a total state of shock. And I talked, I don't know if you knew Henry Gordon, uh, John Gordon, not the, the wife is Henry Gordon. He told me once that his mother didn't come back. And he did feel abandoned to some extent, young children, you know, what was going on around. It was such a hard thing to, to believe and understand. And uh, to some extent, it was a sense of abandonment. Many of us felt, you know, that we don't have the parent come back for us. And my luck from early on was that I looked out for some other people who needed help. And uh, unfortunately, my late husband died in 1987. And it was complications, which was due to tuberculosis that he had during the you know, after being liberated. And going back to work was the most healing process. I did attend uh, grieving uh, sessions and everything, but the biggest way to handle things was, the best way was when the emphasis, I kind of switched off from me and try to see how I can help the community. And I'm still extremely active. I'm on multiple community events and uh, still part of the Holocaust Advisory Board. And participate in uh, events where we can kind of share some of the stories and connecting with family and friends. It's really essential. You. And you've seen me in action. Yes, I have. I can, I can vouch for Ava. Um, thank you. How did your experience and the abandonment that you felt 
um, affect the way that you were as a mother with your children? I think I was told I was overprotective. And to some extent, over demanding. The kids really had to have a, their own schedule. And in our family, it didn't matter if you were a boy or a girl. You had to learn everything. My late husband taught them how to change tires and do this and that. So from early age on, all the kids really learned a lot of things. And from early age on, uh, my second son became a physician and he has been traveling around to countries where they have limited medical thing and his whole family, his wife and two children have gone with him. And uh, many times he has been awarded as an outstanding physician. And my uh, older daughter was pre-med and when she was ready to take her MCAT, she decided that's not for her. And she became a, an architect. And you have to see some of her projects, they are amazing. And my younger daughter, she got a PhD in neuroscience and a postdoctorate. And then she decided that's not for her. So she went back to school and she became a teacher. And she loved teaching and people were fighting to get into her class. So all the kids from early on learned to give back to the community. Thank you very much. Um, how did your photographs survive? How did you survive? The photographs that you have, the family photos. Oh, the photographs through my mother, I ended up getting it from my uh, aunt, my mother's younger sister, not the youngest, but younger sister. Her name was Blanca. And I connected with her early on. And this picture is my aunt, my mother. And these were the two pictures. You know, they were tiny little pictures. And you could even see my mother's handwriting on it. So for me to have these pictures, I'm one of the lucky ones because many, many people didn't have that luxury of having a picture. The picture of my grandparents, I received from my uncle on my father's side and he went back to Hungary that was the little boy. And he died about three years ago. And he went back in 1965 to Hungary and found the picture. And the whole family ended up getting a picture of it. So it's, we are one of the lucky ones to have pictures. Unfortunately, I have absolutely no pictures on my uh, maternal side. And I was very close with my grandmother. I did visit very often. And I told you that I had my Red Cross certificate. I did bring it with me. <laughs> so much for sharing. Um, before we conclude, I also just want to share, this is the book that Ava mentioned. It's 52 stories from child survivors of the Holocaust. Ava's story is in here. 
and she inscribed it to me as well. And there is a photo here of her with her mother and her father. Um, and Ava also wrote her husband's story as well, her late husband's story. Um, to conclude, what is something that you would like the audience to take away from listening to your story this afternoon? I usually put tremendous emphasis, please, please, don't keep hatred as your companion. Use compassion whenever you can. And also, don't be a silent observer. If you do see injustice around you, you do have to speak up. And I think we can really use that today. And reaching out, you know, when you reach out to people who are locked up and alone, it really is so sad to see. And sometimes a little phone call can make such a big difference. There are a couple of people I call on a regular basis and when they hear my voice, they really, really come alive to some extent because being alone is not simple. So we can all, all do that to reach out and make sure that we provide compassion to people around us. Thank you so much, Ava. As I mentioned um, at the beginning of this program, our museum was founded by Holocaust survivors whose mission was to always make sure that this history would never be forgotten and that we commemorate, educate, and inspire future. We can't do the work that we do um, without Ava and the other volunteers who share their stories on a regular basis. And I also wanted to remind everybody that if anyone uh, of the audience members, if anyone's a teacher, if you know any teachers, we provide free educational programs on a regular basis. Um, we have virtual tours and virtual speakers that we can arrange for your classroom. Uh, if you're interested, you can visit our website, holocaustmuseumla.org. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention and for your questions. And thank you again so much, Ava, for sharing this story with us. I know we will, everybody will remember your story after today. So we thank you so much. Wishing everybody a happy, healthy, and safe weekend ahead. And we hope to visit, welcome you all to the museum in person at some point in the near future. But in the meantime, be well. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Ava. Thank you.